All right, let's go to our <coughs> text today. Uh, we begin our series from the book of Ezra. And uh, we took our time in chapter 1. Today we will focus on Ezra chapter 2, verse 1 to 70. Uh, it's a very short chapter. Ezra chapter... The 2 verse 1 to 17 and the title today is is your name in the list this chapter and also Nehemiah chapter 7 these two chapters have identical name list uh, of the people of Israel who return from Babylon there are few variations and there could be uh, scribal difficulties of maintaining purity of the text uh, due to copying a copyist must have made some mistakes otherwise they are identical name lists all the, the people's names are listed there 97 percent of the chapter is about names and numbers names and numbers names and numbers so i don't know what i will make out of it but the title is is your name in the list so when I talk about the name in the list, I remember one memorable incident in my life when I was uh, finishing my high school. In those days in Nepal, after the high school, you have to appear a national board exam. Those exams are not given by the school, that's given by the National Board of Education. And they were very tough, only 10% and sometime in my during my time, 13% of the whole national student body used to pass their test. So to be able to pass the national board of, for high school was a sign of education. If you pass that test, you are an educated person. So that time I had accepted Christ, but my background, I would leave for you to guess. But... Uh, as I appeared, the test, I had my prayer and I, I believed God would do miracles in my life. And then the result would come in a national newspaper. Now, in these days, you know, you can just check in your mobile phone or whatever. But those days, uh, the national board exams result would be published in a national newspaper that would be printed only in the capital and it will take one week to travel to the place where I was living in my town. Uh, to travel from my home place to Kathmandu, it used to take five, six days. We had to go to India and then cross over and come back again. So you can imagine where I was living. <laughs> Nepal is not that big country, but yet it was a difficult place. Finally, the results came and uh, I didn't even know how to check my results. So I asked uh, a person who was a government employee who knew about all these things. He took me to the place where I could get the paper. So we checked. My last number was zero. I forgot the front. The last was zero. So we check all these numbers and the matching my numbers and up to nine. Then there is no zero. And then again start with six, seven, eight, something again. So there was no number in the list and it was a very lost feeling. It was a kind of something finished in your life. To fail was a very painful experience and I had nowhere else to go. Now I had no chance of repeating my one year of waiting and I had no place to wait. I was hoping I'll pass the national exam and immediately I'll get a job those days. Once you have a high school, you get a job. Nepal was a very wonderful place to live in those days, except for the communist and Christians. It was a beautiful place. There was no poor people those days in Nepal. Everyone has a decent life. So once you have a high school diploma, you had a job. But now here I lost it. I just didn't, I don't remember what I did after that, but uh, I, I, I walked from that place to where I was staying and not knowing where I was going. Okay. 
all my friends, we had 64 students from that particular school. In my class, 64 students, we had given the exam, national board test. I don't want to meet any of them. I didn't meet anyone. For three months, I sat myself somewhere. During that time, most of these students have admitted themselves in colleges and universities. Uh, some had gotten job. After three months, somehow, I decided to go to school and see my transcript and wanted to see how many courses I failed and what I got and what I didn't. As I walked into the school compound, a teacher rushes towards me and begins to scold me like anything. <laughs> you bloody fool! Like that. A terrible word he used. Where have you been? We were looking for you everywhere we couldn't find you. We thought you were dead. I said, what's the matter? Why should I come here? Out of 64, four students passed from my school and you had one of them. Then I said, I didn't see my number. The stupid printer made a mistake. The zero became nine. That was your number, but then the, due to the printer, it became nine. You know, three months of agony because my number was not in the list. <laughs> How significant was that for me? Ezra is recording one of the most significant list for the people of Israel. In fact, this would become the foundation for the nation of Israel one more time. And these were the people known as remnant. And in the Bible, remnants are romanticized by God himself. Remnants are the people that God delights upon. For the remnants, God would do anything, and these were the remnants. For example, when God wanted to destroy the whole world, he saw Noah and his family. When God wanted to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, he saw Lot and his daughters. When Jacob's son were all evil, there was Joseph. When the kings of Israel and Judah were evil, there were kings like Josiah and Jehoshaphat. Thus, there were some people who were remnant. And God delights in those who are faithful in the face of the toughest and adverse situations. And here in this list, we see these people whom God has moved their hearts and who God had chosen to be the remnant, to lay a foundation for a new nation, for the continuity of the covenant of God, continuity for the tribe of Judah, for the Messiah to come and deliver his people. And therefore, my friend, this list is very, very important. Those people whose names are mentioned here. Now, this list is not exhaustive in a sense. If you see the numbers add together and the total number, they don't match. In fact, Ezra is somehow selectively choosing the important figures and the family heads and then putting together to show that God is interested in all of these people because they were the one whose heart were moved when God spoke to them through Cyrus, through Daniel, and through Ezra, Nehemiah, and many other people. So, when you think of this list, think about another list that is kept in heaven. In Luke chapter 10, Jesus sends his disciples two by two, go and preach the gospel, heal the sick, cast out evil spirit, raise the dead, cleanse the leper. And they did wonderful, amazing things and they came back to Jesus. And they said, Lord, in your name, the evil spirit submitted to us and we could cast them out. And Jesus tells in Luke 10, 20, Yes, you did very well, but don't rejoice because you were able to cast out the evil spirits. But rejoice because your names are written in heaven. You and I ought to rejoice because our names are in the list. Your name and my name is in the book of the Lamb. And also, in fact, 
No one knows that name except the giver and the receiver. That means no one has the power and authority to meddle with your name, to play with it, or tamper with it. God knows and you will know that amazing name that God has recorded for you in heaven. So here this list today should tell us something about God's selective will for us to continue in his kingdom, to do his will, to do his bidding, to fulfill his purpose while we are in this world. And Ezra's list is an immensely important list for the nation of Israel. Let's just see a few things from this list. Number one, God fulfills his promise. And in this list, we see the actual fulfillment of what God had spoken. Which means God is a living God who never lies. When he said, I will do something, he will do it. Let me read verse 1 and 2. Now these are the people of the province who came up from the captivity of the exiles, whom Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had taken captive to Babylon. They returned to Jerusalem and Judah, each to their own town, in company with Jerubabel, Joshua, Nehemiah, Shariah, Reliah, Mordecai, Bislan, Mispar, Bijai, very difficult name, okay, Rehum and Bana. The list of the men of the people of Israel list goes on and on. And these names you will have to practice so many times. And if you want to pronounce Korean words, this is better to practice. <laughs> It's vernacular language, actually. In this verse 1, we see when Ezra records the name, he makes this statement. He makes sure that he uh, puts this. Now, these are the people of the province. This is province of Judea, who came up from the captivity to exile. Captivity of the exile whom Nebuchadnezzar had taken captive to Babylon. They returned to their own place. From their own place, they were taken captives and taken as prisoners into exile. Now, from Cap Babylon, from captivity, from exile, they are now returning back to their own place. In this action of the exiles coming back to their own place, we see the fulfillment of the prophet's prophecy. Listen what Isaiah said, uh, Jeremiah said, as we saw last week. Jeremiah 29 verse 10 and 14. This is what the Lord says, When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place, to their own place. I will bring you back to this place. Jerusalem, Judea. In 14, I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back from captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and places where I have banished you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back to the place from which I carried you into exile. So these are the exact word 70 years before prophet Jeremiah sent a letter to exile said this is what god is telling so until that time settle down in that city god will bring you back as he has taken you from your place into exile into captivity he is going to bring you back and in this chapter 2 of ezra we see this prophecy actually being fulfilled One of the secrets of successful Christian life is to remember the promises of God and to meditate upon the promises of God, to think about the promises of God. Even when everything is out of your control, when you don't know what to do, even at that time, instead of sitting in sadness and sorrow and putting your hand, uh, head between your knee or whatever you call that, it is always good to pick up the promises of God and say, Lord, I don't know what is happening to me, but this is what you have said and therefore I will trust you. 
any successful Christian you will see in life, if you deeply dig in their life, you will find that's what they do. They are not superhuman beings. They are not so super genius that they can have no problem in their life. They all have problems. We all have problems in life. But the difference between a successful and a happy and a, a confident Christian and a sad and a miserable Christian is that one who takes the promises of God and says, Lord, I know you said it. Even though I can't feel it, I don't see it, I don't have it, but still you said it, I will trust you. But the miserable will say, why did you allow this to me? Why did he do this to me? Why this happened to me? Why that happened to me? We put blames on others and circumstances. We begin to meditate upon circumstances for the miserable Christian life. But for the successful Christian life, we begin to meditate upon the word and the promises of God, even in the worst situation, even when you are in captivity, in exile, as a prisoner, as a person going through serious sadness in your life, begin to take the promises of God because our God is a promise-fulfilling God. Listen what Daniel does. How did he pray? He was also in exile. He was also a prisoner. He also longed for Jerusalem. In fact, three times a day he would open a window towards Jerusalem and pray. He longed for Jerusalem. What did he do? He was reading the prophet's scroll. And suddenly he came to Jeremiah and Isaiah. And Jeremiah says, after 70 years, I will bring back my people. That word, he took it. That promise, he took it. Listen what he said. Instead of me, let him tell you. Daniel chapter 9, verse 1 to 14. Let me read for you. Chapter 9, verse 1 to... In the first year of Darius, son of Xerxes, a Medi by descent, who was made ruler over the Babylonian kingdom, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood from the scriptures according to the word of the Lord given to Jeremiah the prophet that the desolation of Jerusalem would last 70 years. Jerusalem was utterly destroyed. And here is a prophet longing for Jerusalem. And there, there he finds a promise spoken. One prophet is finding a prophecy of another prophet and that is he holding here in his hand. Verse 3. So I turned to the Lord God and pleaded with him in prayer and petition, in fasting and in sackcloth and ashes. A desperation. When he found the scrolls of Jeremiah, when he saw the prophecy of 70 years, he desperately began to seek God and said, This is what you have said. Why should I allow this Sadness and sorrow rule over my... I will seek you. Listen from verse 4. I prayed to the Lord my God and confessed. This is what he prayed. Lord, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments. God is a covenant keeping God. Amen. Daniel knew. Verse 5, we have sinned and done wrong. We have been wicked and have rebel, rebelled. We have turned away from your command and laws. We have not listened to your servant, the prophet. We who spoke in your name to our king, our princes and our ancestors and to all the people of the land. Lord, you are righteous. But this day we are covered with shame. The people of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem and all Israel, both near and far, in all the countries where you have scattered us because of our unfaithfulness to you. We and our kings, our princes, and our ancestors have, are covered with the same. Lord, because we have sinned against you, Lord, our God, your mercy is merciful to fulfill. When God began to move the hearts of the exile, look at what kind of people. Verse 3 to 35, if you see, they are general people from different localities. You know, Israel was utterly uh, destroyed and there were some Foreign people were there, unknown people were there, Gentile, heathen, mixed people, the Samaritan kind of people were there. But God began to select certain localities so that when they go back, they will again populate those lands, those places to bring back the glory of its nation. So uh, there are various leaders from various localities. 
And then verse 36 to 39, the priest, God began to move the hearts of the priest. You have to follow with me since I cannot read these names. It will take me so long to pronounce those names. <laughs> Not that I want to avoid it, but the local leaders of various localities, geographical location, then priest, 36 to 39, then 40 to 41, the Levites, priests, Levites, then 42, the gatekeepers of the temple, 43 to 40, 53, the temple servants, the one who will work in the temple, and then lastly, the royal servants, the servants of Solomon. Maybe they had a particular responsibility given in the temple by Solomon and known as servants of Solomon after that. Solomon was gone, of course. These were people with different experiences, different background. So God has selected these people so that he will again be able to create this perfect community. If only priests come, there would be a problem. You know, if only servants come, there would be a problem. If only the Levites come, there would be a problem. But God began to prompt the hearts of all these kinds of people who were willing to leave behind the prosperous city life and go to this desolate land of Jerusalem. Hostile land. In fact, when we see later, when they came, they were severely challenged by the local people who never wanted them to return. But back in Babylon, they were happy, they had settled, they had houses, they had land, they were quite happy there. But when God began to speak, He spoke to diverse people, people of various kind, to bring the beauty of God's community. And therefore, every time we come to church like this, it's a wonderful experience that we are truly the children of God coming from diverse background. Thirdly, and quickly, importance of spiritual ancestry. In this list, we see, first of all, God fulfilling His promise. And we see the people of God, like Daniel and Exiles, meditating upon the promise instead of their captivity. Then we saw the, the importance of the value of diversity. God began to bring all kinds of people to create a new community. And that we see today in the Church of Jesus Christ throughout the world. And thirdly, the spiritual ancestry. There were some people who didn't know whether they were Jews or Gentiles, but they wanted to go to the God began to move even their hearts. Verse 55 to 58, sorry, 59 to 63, there it says, the following came from the town of Telmez, Telmars, Kerub, Abdon, and all this, but they could not show that their families were descended from Israel. They didn't know whether they are Jews or Gentiles, but they were living among them. But God began to call them, and they decided to go. And then uh, look at 61. And from among the priests, these are Israel priests, but the descendant of this, 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 62. These searched for their family records, but they could not find them, and so were excluded from the priesthood as unclean. The governor ordered them not to eat any of the most sacred food until there was a priest ministering with Urim and Thummim. There are two kinds of people here. One didn't know whether they are Jews or Gentile, and they came, and they couldn't take part in sacred activity of a community. Second, they were priests, but yet they had no lineage recorded. They couldn't find whose descendants they were, and yet they were told not to take part in these holy activity. The point is, there are no shortcut in the kingdom of God. You've got to be connected with your spiritual ancestry. Your, your spiritual ancestry has to be right if not, you are not going to get into the kingdom of God. But praise God, today we have a spiritual ancestry through Jesus Christ. Amen. The Old Testament is a shadow or the type of what was coming. And here these people had to make sure, and those people were confused. And finally, the priest had to use the ancient method of finding the will of God. The Thumim and Umim, all these uh, 
uh, Hebrew way of discovering whether this is right or that is right. So somehow there was a, we don't know the outcome, but they were given a chance before God to see whether they were accepted or not. The point is, we need to have a right spiritual ancestor. We need to be connected with our Messiah in order to be able to take part in the kingdom of God. In Matthew chapter 28, Jesus said, All authority is given to me. And therefore, I tell you, go. And in Colossians chapter 2, verse 13 to 15, Paul said, Whatever was written against us, the legal document that was against us, Jesus has torn it and taken it to the cross and nailed it. So now we have a spiritual authority from Christ and a legal authority from Christ. That we are the descendant of God by faith. We are the children of Abraham by faith through Jesus Christ. Amen. So whatever was against us, Jesus has cancelled it. Make sure you are connected with Christ. And lastly, verse 64 to 17. Willing contribution by the people of God is God's way of meeting the needs of his community. Willing contribution of the people of God is God's way of meeting the need of his community. God is building a new community, but how is he meeting that need? There are people who are willing to offer what they have to meet the need that is in there. Let me read 64. The whole company numbered, that's a summary of course, how many people and all, and Verse 68, when they arrived at the house of the Lord in Jerusalem, some of the heads of the families gave free will offerings towards the rebuilding of the house of God on its site. According to their ability, they gave to the treasury for this work 61,000 darics of gold and 5,000 min, I couldn't read this one, of silver and 100 priestly garments the priests, the Levite, the musicians, the gatekeepers, and the temple servants settled in their own towns along with some of the other people and the rest of the Israelites settled in their own town. So from this list, we see God fulfilling his word to reestablish his nation. In this list, we see the importance of diversity in God's community. Whenever there is a nationalistic spirit, whenever there is a tribal mentality, whenever there is a group mentality, that is not the will of God. In churches, in denomination, in Christian community, oh, we are special, they are not special. That's not God's will. God loves diversity because we all are God's children and the reason there is diversity is because it is the will of God. God intended it that way but sometimes we become wiser than God and say we are the special people they are not so important as we are. That's not God's will. Then thirdly we saw how our spiritual ancestry to be rightly connected with Christ. If you are not connected with Christ I'm afraid you're wasting your time in the church. Be connected with Christ. In fact, in John 15 is the crucial chapter when it comes to spiritual ancestry. He says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Apart from me, you can do nothing. But if you remain in me and my words remain in you, then ask whatever you desire and I'll give it to you. You will bear fruit, you will multiply, you will bring glory to God and you will be my witness, you will be my friend. You can do greater than what I have done. That is what Jesus said. If you're connected with Christ, you have the opportunity to go into the temple and take part in holy activities. And finally, we see here willing contribution by the people of God. As they came to the site, you can imagine, they came to Jerusalem and they went to the Temple Mount that we call even today Temple Mount. As they went there, their hearts were moved and say, Oh God, thank you for bringing, thank you for giving us these gifts and these talents and ability to earn money. And they began to take out the money 
and gold and silver and began to give into the hand of the leader and say, go ahead and build this temple as soon as possible. As soon as they came, their hearts were moved. God loves a cheerful giver, says Paul. And then secondly, it's a free will offering. They freely gave, no compulsion. Nobody told them to give. My friend, do you want to test the temperature of your spirituality? Then be honest with yourself as how you use your money. Is there a place for the kingdom of God in your money? Are you waiting for to be a successful and health, wealthy, rich person to give? Or are you willing to give out of whatever you have for the kingdom of God? That will test the temperature of your spirituality. Sometime we may justify not really contributing to the things of God by this way, that, but the biblical principle is always there that we cannot serve two masters. Either we'll serve God or we'll serve money. When we serve God, then whatever we have becomes a tool in extending God's kingdom in our families, in our communities, in our churches, in our world. So here we see free will offering. Then see, number third, according to their ability. Now God never demands you to give more than what you can. According to their ability. Their, their hearts were moved, and they gave freely, and they gave according to their ability. Now this may sound an Old Testament principle. Let me read you what Paul says in New Testament, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1 to 7. It is a repetition of what we read in the Old Testament. Here it says, And now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. In the midst of a very severe trial, their overflow, for overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability. Entirely on their own, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in the service to the Lord's people. And they exceeded our expectation. They gave themselves first of all to the Lord and then by the will of God also to us. So we urge Titus, just as he had earlier made a beginning, to bring also to completion this act of grace on your part. He is writing this to Corinthian church motivating them to give for the cause of the kingdom of God in Jerusalem. Seven, but since you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in the love we have kindled in you, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. Paul is not telling them, wait until you have a successful business or career. He is telling, look at the Macedonian church, out of their poverty, they were filled with the spirit of generosity. They gave beyond our expectation. In fact, sometimes Paul must be feeling sorry to receive that offering because they themselves were suffering. But they said, they requested, no, Paul, we want to serve God through this. Here are the Jews coming from Babylon. They saw the desert land of Jerusalem. They saw the burned down houses and broken down wall. They saw the temple reduced to the ground. They saw these Gentiles ruling and just destroying their future there. And they were moved and they say, maybe to Jerubabel, this is all we can do. Build this temple. Bring the glory of God back to this land. And they gave freely. And they gave according to their ability. So my brothers and sisters, you want your name in the list in the book of the Lamb? Make sure you are believing in the promises of God. Even in your salvation issue, for example, by faith we are saved, not by your own action. We are saved by grace through faith. You need to trust the cross of Christ for your salvation. In the same way, you need to trust the promises of Christ in all areas of your life. And you will see the difference. 
And you need to love people of diverse background. If there is any trace of racism, if there is any trace of discrimination against one another, you need to turn from that wicked ways. That is not in line with the promises of God. And you need to ask God to cleanse your heart. Then you need to check your life. Are you engrafted in Christ? If you are engrafted, you are safe and secure. Your, your life is hidden in Christ. No one can take away your life from you or from Christ. And finally, willing to contribute, be it finances, be your time, be your talent, be your gift, whatever it is, be defined by generosity. Generous person to extend the kingdom of God, to elevate people's suffering and pain. And your name will surely be in that list. Amen? Amen. Shall we close our eyes?